Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Joe Vore Podcast, JV Podcast Network. We have a very special guest, Sammy. Now, I, I totally forgot to ask how to pronounce your last name. Is it Brielle? Yeah, perfect. Sammy Brielle. Okay. It wasn't that tough of a one, so that's kind of like, you know, I get moderate scores from the judges there. So, Sammy Brielle, <laughs> aspiring influencer. You are rocking it on social media, like over 20K on Instagram, over like 200K on TikTok. Um, YouTube is grow, going great. I was checking out that as well, over like 6,000 subscribers, but your videos have a ton of views. It's super engaging, fun stuff. Um, so yeah. of, of course, I've really enjoyed checking all of that stuff uh, out. Now, when I say influencer and people hear influencer, like Instagram model, I feel like a lot of people, even younger people will kind of like roll their eyes because they just hear that and they're just like, what even is that? So you as an aspiring influencer wanting to get into that, wanting to make that a career, something where you could actually monetize and live off of the content that you create, the pictures you post, whatever it may be on your social media platforms. What does that kind of look like? Could like explain like the, the audience is five years old, like what you would be doing, how you monetize that, the relationships, you know, that people have with brands and uh, things like that. So obviously I'm just starting up, so I'm not really completely sure. I've only done a few brand deals. Some brands have reached out to me. I've reached out to some brands. Sometimes you hear back, sometimes you don't. But the whole thing about being an influencer, like you said, people roll their eyes. People don't see it as a real career path. But then I grew up looking up to all these influencers. These people were the people who got me through tough times. These were the people who inspired me to become the person that I am today. And obviously I think it's a, genera a generational thing. You know, like when I told my parents, you know, my dream is to be a social media influencer. I talked to my father, who's a businessman who worked on Wall Street, and my mother, who's a social worker. And, you know, they're not, they weren't too happy about that. But eventually I explained to them, you know, social media is going to be the biggest industry in the world. It is just growing and growing every year. Even with TikTok alone, there's about to be a $2 billion creator fund. You're about to be monetized just for getting views on TikTok, which is insane in itself. But you know, obviously social media is one of the biggest industries in the world now, and it's going to just keep growing and growing. And so I think that people will start to respect the title of influencer and the fact that people are able to make a living off of social media more and more as the years go on and the industry continues to grow. On my end, the idea of being an influencer is so appealing to me because I want a platform to spread positivity. I think that you know, the influencers I grew up watching on YouTube, they really changed me as a person. And I think that I would love to be like a role model to younger kids in the way that the other people, the other influencers I watched were to me. That's awesome. Now, I, I want to get into something that I found really fascinating. The, the one video on your YouTube channel that really jumped out to me was your college decision video. And it has a ton mm -hmm. of views and I wasn't able to get all the way through it. So I want to go over the, the stuff that I saw that I want you to kind of fill me in and fill everyone in, else in about it. Um, so you just, no, so did you just graduate from high school this year? This yeah, I just graduated class of 2020. Okay, awesome. Very cool. Well, I feel like such an old man. I just graduated college, so I'm like so much older than you. I don't even know how ages work. I could be old enough to be your dad. I would have no idea. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm just that out of touch with reality. That's how old I feel now. But so your your video and I was watching it and it was really cool because it came out about four months ago. But you put this video together over several months. There's footage in there from you getting decisions. You uh, applied to what was it like 16 schools? I think it was 18 or 19, perhaps. OK, so almost you've applied to almost 20 schools and you have footage in there dating all the way back to like November when decision letters started coming out, December, yeah. you know, January and so on and so forth. Um, now, before we get into that, drop your stats that you dropped in the beginning of the video. I want people to know like your, your grades, your test scores, extracurriculars, everything, because <laughs> you you were legit. I was like, I had to go back and watch. I'm like, wait, what did she just say? I want everyone to know what kind of brainiac that uh, we're dealing. You're definitely the smartest person that I've ever talked to and certainly been on this show. I just, just have to say. Thank you. Well, I'm very school smart, but that's because I study and I work hard. I'm not very street smart. If you throw me on the streets, I probably wouldn't last a day. But with regards to my stats, I got a 35 out of 36 on the ACT. That was a 33, a 34, 35, 36 on the four 
sections, uh, 36 on the math, and then my lowest was the 33 on the science, and the two English sections were 34 and 35. And then I had a 5.1 GPA. It's very weighted. I don't really know how it works, but basically it meant that I got all A's in AP and honors classes throughout high school. I did the varsity dance team for three years. I was in Key Club, Interact Club, Make-A-Wish Club, did student government. I was also in a fine performing arts center. So my schedule was actually limited. That's why my GPA was 5.1. It could have been higher if I had taken more AP classes, but I was only able to take, I think I took seven APs, or no, six, I took six APs. And that was because I would go to school and do history, math, science, and then dance and performing arts type classes. It was kind of like victorious. So <laughs> being in the FPAC program, the fine performing arts program that I was in, it was very nice. It was, it definitely made my high school experience interesting to say the least. But what are some other stats I could give? No, I think um, that covers everything. I think yeah, people understand yeah. you got the GPA, obviously the ACT is super high. And then I think the biggest thing now is because there's tons of people, you know, more than you think that have those kind of grades, but really sets you apart of those extracurriculars like you talked about. Um, so with that resume, I feel like anyone, I certainly would think there's no school in this country, there's probably no school in this world that would turn you down. But, you know, and you applied to some big time schools like University of Pennsylvania, I saw Harvard in there, Duke, even University of Miami, people think Miami party school, but isn't that a private school? It's a pretty tough school to get into. Yeah, 33% acceptance rate. It's a decent school. Yeah, yeah. So that's, you know, that's, that's not, it's not like Arizona State where they're letting in like 102% of the people that apply. Like people, it's like, it's like the COVID test. People who like don't get their COVID test and get the results back that it's positive, false positives. That's what happens at Arizona State. They like people that don't even apply get an acceptance letter, I swear. It's, <laughs> it's, it's like, that's like the best thing I could compare it to. But so, oh so um, list the schools that didn't accept you because I didn't get to all that. I was like fascinated that like any school you wouldn't get into with that resume. It was actually a sad majority of the schools that I was not accepted into. I will pull up the list right now. Yeah. I got accepted. I think to six schools. So I applied to, I applied to, okay, actually I'll just list it based on if I got in or not. I got into the University of Maryland, University of Miami, Northeastern University, University of Texas at Austin, and I was waitlisted at UPenn and UCLA. I also got into Case Western Reserve University. Nice. And then I was rejected by University of Virginia, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Duke, Vanderbilt, Harvard, Yale. I think that might be it. Yeah. Oh, and University of Southern California. Uh huh. And I was waitlisted by UCLA and UPenn. Mm -hmm. And the thing, the big thing about my video was that USC, UCLA, and UPenn were my three dream schools. Yeah. I was waitlisted by USC. Sorry, I was rejected by USC. Waitlisted by UCLA and waitlisted by UPenn. And it was really hard for me being waitlisted by all three of, or being waitlisted by two of my top schools. But ultimately I got into UCLA, which is really great. I'm going there in the fall and I'm super excited. Well, congratulations on that. I was gonna ask, I didn't get to where you decided to go to school. Now UCLA, I know some people that have gone there, Are they're a little different. Are they on, uh, they're on quarters rather than semesters, right? Is that, do you know, do you have any idea? I don't, when does like, when are you supposed to start school at UCLA? Like what's going on? Cause obviously them being in Los Angeles and with COVID going on right now, like what has been the impact of COVID on you trying to start your freshman year of college? So obviously COVID has very much impacted my freshman year of college, but I'm still going to be moving to California in about three weeks. I'm moving. I got an apartment with four other girls who are UCLA students as well and we're all moving out to LA. But UCLA is not doing on-campus dorming this year. But even when they did have on-campus dorming available, they actually just declared no on-campus dorming two days ago. Even when they were having that as an option, I wasn't going to be doing that because my roommates and I found this apartment and it was better monetarily. It's not gonna be as much for rent as it would have been for room and board at UCLA. Room and board is 20K a year. Overall, I would have been paying 65K a year which is crazy, but now it's just 45K a year plus the rent, which is still 
crazy, but a little less crazy. Um, yeah. But I'm going to be taking classes online, attending UCLA through Zoom, I'm guessing. But I still wanted to move out to LA, so I got this apartment. I'm hoping to kind of pursue some things in the entertainment industry while I'm out there, make some connections, have some fun, and yeah. Yeah, well, you'll do all that out in LA. That's that's what's as long as things start to open back up, because that's that's what goes on out there. How do you feel about moving so far away? Because I did that too. I'm from Ohio. I'm actually home visiting right now. But I went, to, like I said, I went to Arizona State. So being an out of state kid and not just being out of state, but you're going literally from coast to coast. Um, yeah. You know, obviously, like that's where you want to be, and you're excited. Um, about that, but you know, it presents challenges for everyone, no matter how outgoing you are, you know, it's, it'll be a big adjustment. Like, have you spent a lot of time in LA before this, or is this going to be like really brand new to you? So I actually, for my 16th birthday, my mother took my best friend, Emily and I to Los Angeles for a week to visit UCLA and USC and uh, as like my sweet 16 present. So I spent that one week in LA and I fell in love with it. I felt that that was the city I belonged in. So then a few months after that, the summer of last year, so the summer of 2019, I spent three weeks dorming as a UCLA student. I did a musical theater summer intensive. So I actually already have four summer or four college credits at UCLA. So I did live at UCLA's campus for three weeks, which I guess might be the only time I'm dorming ever in the school when I, before I was even a student. But I did live there for three weeks last summer. So it's not completely new to me. I definitely know the campus of UCLA a lot better than I would say the average freshman who's only like done a tour because mm -hmm. I lived there for three weeks. But it is definitely going to be difficult. It'll come with challenges. I think that what has me going is the fact that I've been living in New Jersey for 17 years and I have never really liked it here. I've always wanted a change and this is the change I've always wanted. So I'm more excited than I am nervous. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's really exciting. What, what was that? Um, I, I'm intrigued. What, what was that program like? You did that theater intensive program when you're out UCLA. What, what was that like, especially being, you know, younger away from home, living on that dorm? I know you said, you know, that's where you want to be. So you're probably excited about it, but still, you know, that's, that's, a, that's an adjustment. And then you're, you know, in this intense program, that's probably really exciting, but it's definitely going to challenge you. So how did you balance all of that for those three weeks that uh, you were there? So last summer I did that three week program, I was 16, but the year before I had done a three week program at Yale when I was 15. So I was kind of away, like away from home for good periods of time. So I was kind of used to that. The UCLA program though was very rigorous. It was called, M it was called MTSI, M-T-S-I, Musical Theater Summer Intensive. And we were taking classes from about 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. every day with obviously a lunch break and little, um, snack breaks, but it was very rigorous. It kind of opened my eyes to what being a college student would be like, and more specifically a musical theater major. I'm not a musical theater major, but it was something I was considering applying to schools for. I liked it, it was very fun, but it was a lot of work. It was a very intense program. We were practicing all the time, but it, it was great, I liked it. It was, it was interesting, it was very much an eye opener, like, you know, both both programs, the Yale program and the UCLA program, both made me realize, like, you know, I'm going off to college soon. I, I do my own laundry now. I do all my own things. I'm independent. I need to also, like, make sure I'm staying safe, not going out in the city alone. I would always make sure I was with people. But it definitely helped me feel more independent and made me realize that, like, if I wanted to be independent, I totally could. Yeah. And that I had that ability to do that. That's awesome. So have you declared anything at UCLA in terms of what you're going to be studying yet? Nope, I'm undecided. There you go. There you, so you could literally, that, that'll be, that could, you know, that's going to be a little scary at first, I imagine. But I think, but it, the way that you're talking and you, I really feel that, you know, I'm excited for you because I've been there too. And it's, it's, it's just going to be a really great discovery period I feel like for you I know I did a lot of that I never changed my major but the stuff that I was that I'm doing now and started to do was way kind of different than my major um so yeah never get discouraged about any of that stuff because you, you're just just enjoy everything try everything and you'll you'll if you throw yourself out there enough you'll end up finding your way and that's what I did because you'll learn almost learning what you want to do and which direction you want to go is just as important Actually, I think it's more important to go out and do stuff and find out maybe 
like what you wouldn't want to do because you really don't know until you're trying something. Yeah, for sure. I definitely think I'll find my path. My dream, like I said, is to pursue social media. That's why I'm undecided. There's really nothing I could see myself doing other than making content because it's truly what I love. But, you know, I'm just going to work my hardest at that. And if it doesn't work out, I'm going to a great school. And I'm sure no matter what, I'm going to have a great experience there. And whatever degree I end up coming out with, I have no idea what it's going to be, but it'll be something. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Now I want to transition to this. I want to talk about my, uh, what I was scrolling through quickly, I came across is, I think this is my favorite, um, your Instagram or TikTok video. I think I saw it on both. Um, it was so funny. It was, uh, the, the caption was like, your, your guy friends react, reacting to like the, the W, what is it, like the WAP dance? WAP dance. WAP dance. Yes, that's how like old I am. I just, I can't say things. Um, <laughs> but it was so funny because the dynamic of it, it seemed like, so there's like the one guy who's like, like, Vibe. like, yeah, like, yes, like you go girl, like, yes, queen, slay, like all that stuff. And there's the one guy who like can't look because, there's probably like a you're like not brother and sister but there's like a brother sister like protective dynamic and then there's like the one guy who maybe there's like a little sexual tension there's like you gotta stop this you gotta knock this off and i was just cracking up at the dynamic of it because i did this one video this interview video like could guys and girls be just friends and i wanted to ask you about it because when, when i saw that video and i was thinking about the and seeing those dynamics now obviously you were doing that for like like it was a comedic video right but I was but I wanted to ask you about this because when I was asking you know you know there were some people you know some people said yes guys and girls can be just friends some people said no but when I asked them the follow-up question um I was asking them you know let's say you know I was interviewing you and I asked hey do you think your guy friends if given the opportunity they would be more than friends with you and the way that the girls answered versus the way that the guys answered and vice versa was very different, very interesting. And I feel like everyone kind of, you know, there was a lot of girls who, and a lot of the guys, you know, kind of their egos were like, well, yeah, of course they would, right? You know, cause they feel good about right. themselves. But then when it was kind of asked the other way around, they were just like, oh no, like I want to do that. So I, I wanted to ask you kind of about that, like, dynamic like if i was interviewing you we'll play we'll play hypothetical here if i asked you can guys and girls be just friends kind of how would you uh talk about that my answer would be 110 percent. i think that people will have guy best friends and then people could have their brothers so i personally my neighbors their names are noah and dylan they're identical twins they are two months older than me and we have been friends since we were i was six months old they were seven months or eight months old and we grew up like triplets. We have very similar family dynamics. We live right across the street from one another. We both went to the same Jewish preschool. We have so much in common and the three of us grew up like triplets. And to this day, 17 years later, we're best friends and there would never be any, any chance for romance there because I don't consider them my best friends. I consider them my brothers. I introduce them to people as my brothers. They're my family. Obviously, we aren't blood related, but we act like we are, and that dynamic is there. We are, yes, are we best friends? Yeah, but I treat them like my brother. They treat me like their sister. They get mad when I talk about boys. They don't, they're super protective. They never want boys around me um, that aren't them. But I totally think it is 100% possible for girls and boys to just be friends. And it pisses me off when people think that that isn't a possibility because you also need to think, someone who's gay right let's say there's a girl who's gay are you gonna go out and ask her is it not possible for you to just be friends with a girl no right because that's not rational it doesn't make sense just a girl who's straight and a guy who's straight why can't they be friends just for the sake of being friends it doesn't make sense to me people sexualize things way too much yeah, i guess no. it's a little critical from me talking about doing the wop dance and all but i don't know it's just my no, opinion. that kind of brings me to my next thing but first off like i totally agree but where it gets messy and where, where it gets messy and where like i get the most sad is like you know if you know one of you one of those one of those twins right like they get a girlfriend and obviously you guys have been close forever like you've known each other forever you said you know blood is the only thing that separates you guys from being brother and sister 
-hmm. and where it gets messy is when like jealousy comes in because like you on the outside to her seem like a threat when in reality you aren't a threat at all and it becomes especially when you're younger people are immature and it's it's just it's really tough to handle those situations it sucks when someone loses a friend you know whether it's for six months, a year, and then you know, enough. Sometimes enough time goes by, and enough things change, and people evolve that you could lose that friend forever. That's where I get the most sad about it, because it's like there's no reason to like. Good friends are so hard to come by. Like you really gotta. I I would just try to do everything that I could to to to, to not lose that, because the the your friends can be around forever. Like relationships come and go. Right. Absolutely. Um. Well, I, I wanna I wanna kind of wrap up with this kind of an in another interesting dynamic here. Um, so like we were talking about like those videos like the dance or whatever and like influencers and Instagram models. Um, I, I was just thinking about this a few months ago. Do you follow? Do you listen? Are you part of the Daddy Gang? Oh my God, a hundred percent, yes. Love it. Same here. So we're both members. I got my card here in my wallet and everything. Um, but so so what what kind of was cracking me up and i really kind of came to a realization i wasn't like super into it you know i'll listen i don't listen religiously but here and there and i follow it but i really was following all of the drama like a few months ago like when alex and sophia's friendship podcast relationship like broke up and what i never really looked deep into this but i feel like people who just don't understand things or don't look for depth they see Instagram models and they see like, for example, like Alex who hosts Call Her Daddy and they think, oh, this girl is just, um, you know, you know what, and they think only bad things, and only sexual things about them because that's what their podcast persona is or that's what their social media persona is. But if you look at the depth, I listened to all the stuff that Alex talked about and then all the stuff that Dave Portnoy talked about when, and I, I and then now since Alex has moved on and I've listened to her like do some actual interviews, and I'm like, wow, I'm so glad that the show has evolved to this because now people are seeing, like, I feel like the show is just adding a whole new side to it because Alex, like, like you just can't, like, th like the typical, like, douchebag guy would just say, oh, you could throw any girl, you know, any whore or whatever, you know, whatever word you want to use in front of a microphone and talk about sex and it would be incredible. But, like, no, like, Alex is so, what we learned is, like, the way her business savvy when she goes into meetings with sponsors and these interviews, you've seen like how talented and articulate she is. And, you know, she can talk, we've heard her with like Miley Cyrus or her friends and they're all equally as entertaining. And, you know, especially the celebrities who could be more closed off and the way that she gets them to open up and talk, I think has just been so awesome. And then I just think about, and then like, for example, for you, I feel like you kind of fit in the same thing and people who are like you, you see some of these videos and pictures or whatever, but it's like, well, watch like her, like watch her YouTube, like you, you're engaging as a host and you have these great grades and all these extracurriculars and all these different kinds of interests. Um, can you just like talk about kind of like that, which I feel like is kind of the crappy side to being out there in the public eye because people can choose to see you one way and you know one thing works and maybe that's what makes you take off so you're only seeing you're kind of like boxed into one thing but in yeah. reality there's so much more to you as a person you know privately but also publicly but it hasn't had the chance to kind of get out there yes this is like something i think about all the time so with regards to alexandra cooper really quickly i just want to say i think that she is such an inspiring woman and even though people a lot of you know misogynistic old straight white catholic men will hate on her I think she's so inspiring because she encourages women to be open about their sexuality and more comfortable about their sexuality. I know that since listening to her podcast, I've become like more comfortable with mine and more, you know, women have been so suppressed and like told you can't be sexual. Only men are. Men are creatures who just think about sex, sex, sex and women, you're not allowed to. You're, and you know, Alexandra, like she, really kind of breaks that barrier and kind of shows you know it's okay to be sexual it's okay to feel these types of ways and i love her i think she's incredible i do think that there is a deeper meaning behind her podcast there but, is. Um, with regards to like what you were saying about being boxed off i totally struggle with that because 
I make videos where I do pranks and then I do surveys and then I do social justice related videos, but I also talk about education and it's really hard to read these comments sometimes. I don't let hate get to me, but when hate comes for my family and friends, that's when I will go off. So I had a recent video, I did the WAP dance to, in front of my family. I did my family reacts to WAP. In about an hour, there were 700,000 views. And then TikTok took it down, put it on review. Yeah. But within those, that one hour, all of the comments were talking about, your father must be a weak male figure in your life. Your parents don't know what they're doing, this and that. And I was so angry and upset with that because I don't think that a dance should, a dance that I was doing that is slightly provocative should have any indication about my friends or my family. Like, that, that's so ridiculous and rude. I, I ended up taking the video down on Instagram too because well, my, my mom wanted me to because she was upset with the comments. Like I said, I don't let hate get to me, but she, you know, it's hard for her to see that stuff yeah. about her family. But like, it is very difficult when people make assumptions about you based on the one video they see of you. Like, it's very weird how every single comment on all my videos or the comment section on all my videos are so different. Yeah. And then people will compare some of my videos to my newer videos and they'll think, because I did the, the WAP dance, right, for my friends. And they'll be like, I miss the old Sammy, the college Sammy, the college application Sammy. I am the same person. Just because I'm not in front of a computer applying to top universities, not because I'm not doing that right now, but doesn't make me any different of a person. I'm still the same person. It's just annoying how people do assume things based on the one video that they're watching of you. They don't care about your character or they do care about your character, but they care too much and they invest themselves in one part of you as a person. It's frustrating, it is, but ultimately, I aim to show myself as a person, all the aspects of my personality online, and I think I'm doing a pretty decent job with it in the sense that I make a bunch of different videos. It just sucks when people correlate one specific type of aspect of my personality to my whole persona, if that makes sense. Right, no, no, it does for sure, and that just comes with, like too, like, you know, and, and you understand this and there's nothing we can do about it, you know, but the reason that sometimes we get boxed in or they don't see the other things is because like on TikTok, you know, for example, like a dancing video like that is gonna get way more views than another video. Like that's just the way it is. That's gonna get sent around all over the place, even though, you know, more time was put into another video or the other video maybe, you know, it's a different type of content, but that's like, you know, there's a difference between like, you know, like something like, you know, that we're doing right here, you know, having like a long form conversation and it may be good and it's, you know, much like smarter and, you know, could be more engaging to a different audience, but it's not like viral content like a video is or like a, a, a dance reaction video. So sometimes, you know, that's all come, that's all that comes across people's speed and they're just like, oh, that's just like, oh, this, like she has this one video, that must be what all her videos are like. And that's just, right. that's mm -hmm. just, the unfortunate part that's kind of the, the the sucky side of like all the social media stuff sometimes mm -hmm. it's actually quite weird my most viral videos on tiktok are all completely different one of them is a video that i actually had to pay my sister ten dollars for because she wouldn't get in the dress willingly i had to give her money to do it with me we put on prom dresses and just strutted to that sound i don't know if you remember when this sound was very popular but it's like anime is an important part of your culture and then, it, yeah, that whole trend with the putting on the heel, that's one of my most viral videos. And then my two most viral videos are pranks. And then another one is like an educational video. So it's weird how my most viral things are all completely different from each other. It's weird what goes viral and what doesn't. You, you really can't ever tell. No. Yeah, the, really most random, the most random stuff can take off. It's crazy. 100%. And then things that you work hours on. Like I work hours I've written a few comedy sketches out like I'll write them out of my notes I'll dress up as different characters and the funniest series and the videos that I think are the funniest on my account was a series I called um NAA it's like oh maybe I shouldn't talk about this <laughs> oh well already in too deep it's one of my favorite series on my channel it's like a three-part comedy sketch where I kind of impersonate some of the bigger tiktokers on the app yeah and I impersonate like a, what a conversation would be um, at a meeting if they were to all meet together. And I thought it was so funny. It didn't do well, but 
you know, that, that type of comedy sketch, type of comedy sketch that takes hours to write and, um, you know, dress up as and act as different characters. It's sad sometimes how like those types of videos don't do as well as the ones that are super random, yeah. but you know, I'll, I don't know. All I could do is keep trying hard and coming up with creative ideas that hopefully do well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the one thing that I've noticed is, you know, just always just keep doing the stuff that like makes you laugh, makes your friends laugh, that you find entertaining and engaging. And as long as you keep that, you know, authenticity and keep going, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's people out there that have the same type of humor and same type of funny bone and, you know, have same interests as you. It's just, sometimes it just takes some time for, for it to reach them. And, but if you keep going and, and, and keep, uh, keep doing what you want to do, um, it'll eventually get there, you know, per persistence. You just got to put pressure on the system. That's, that's what I've noticed. And it's, um, it's pretty cool when you have those, those breakthroughs. It's really fun. Yeah. And I, I'm so excited for, like, I feel like this is just the beginning, like doing TikTok is just the beginning for me because I've always wanted to start YouTube ever since I was seven years old watching Sky Does Minecraft every day. I would always want to do YouTube and you know, like I said, YouTube is the reason that I'm still here today. If it wasn't for YouTubers and like the comfort I got from watching them, I might not have gotten through high school. I didn't have friends. I studied all the time. I had no social life. I had to quit dancing because I started having health problems. So I turned to these people online for like, for my entertainment, for my happiness. And I always wanted to do the same thing. And my parents never let me because they were worried that colleges would see content I would make and not let me in. My whole life kind of revolved around college, you could probably tell a bit. Yeah. But now that I'm going to a college, I finally convinced my parents to let me have this public TikTok and then eventually convinced them to let me do the YouTube thing. I think, you know, I'm definitely gonna be transitioning onto YouTube a lot more too. I have two really, I think that they're going to be good videos. I hope they're gonna be good videos that I, going to be shooting tomorrow um, at the Jersey Shore. They're going to be social experiments. And I'll talk about one if you want to hear. I don't know. Yes, I, yes, please. We're breaking so, here. I love it. <laughs> so the video that I'm planning on shooting tomorrow is going to be a social experiment at the Jersey Shore, where a lot of my videos are at the Jersey Shore, Point Pleasant Beach and Seaside Heights. And I just go up and down the boardwalk asking random people to be in videos with me. And most of the time they're willing. And some of the times it's actually them coming up to me, asking me to be in a video because they recognize me from TikTok. But the video I'm doing tomorrow is going to be different because it's going to be a long version of the video. It's going to be a full length YouTube video. I've never done one of my pranks slash interviews for a full length YouTube video, but tomorrow I'm going to do my first one. Hopefully it'll go well. I'm going to be asking people at the shore to guess my body count. But the catch is in half of the video, I'm going to be wearing a jeans uh, and a skirt and like sneakers. And the other half of the video, I'm going to be wearing a tight dress and heels. Yeah. And the whole idea of the video is to see, well, if you're asking a stranger, what is the only thing that they could go off on? Right. The way that you sound and the way that you look. They don't know anything about you other than what you're wearing. And so the whole idea of the video is to see well, will people guess and assume things about your sexuality differently based on whether you're dressed provocatively or conservatively? I'm guessing the answer is going to be yes. I'm, my prediction is that the, the answers are, the numbers are going to be higher when I'm wearing the tighter clothes and lower when I'm wearing the more conservative outfit. But I guess we'll see. That, oh, I just flipped something up there. That is an awesome idea. I can't wait. That is, that's going to be so fun. Social experiments are so fun to watch. That's going to be, that's going to be really fun. That's an awesome um, idea. I want to wrap up with this, Sammy. Um, let's say we're 10 years in the future, you know, best case scenario, best case scenario, you know, obviously in entertainment, you know, you just don't have one job you're bouncing around or you're doing different things simultaneously. What would your life look like like what would you be doing kind of day to day what should, what would you be working on whether it's youtube maybe you have some sort of streaming show you know wh whatever wh what's like your biggest dream like best case scenario what you would be doing so in 10 years from now my dream is to well i'll be 27 years old hopefully living in the hollywood hills with a boyfriend and a bunch of pet cats hopefully my job will be to make YouTube videos and do motivational speaking. I would love to speak and do some motivational speaking all around. Hopefully I'm traveling a lot for my job. 
whatever that may be, it would really be awesome if I could get into music. That would be another dream of mine to get into music or fashion. You know, the idea of the the 10 year plan is so confusing to me because I don't have just one interest. I have so many, but no matter what, I hope that in 10 years I am happy and pursuing something that allows others or allows me to try to better society from it. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Well, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I guess we'll see. That's awesome. Well, Sam, I, I really appreciate you doing this. You're a rock star. I love, I've loved watching all of your stuff. Like I crammed, like get everything, everything down because I thought we were going to do this tomorrow, but I'm glad we were able just to jump into it because I felt like I learned a lot of good stuff. And I, I really look forward to continuing to following all your videos and, and what you get, get to do because uh, you're, you're on a great track right now and it's, your stuff is really fun to watch. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you for having me on your podcast.